I will I will start first uh, with a few words uh, on the the setup of this uh, meeting. Uh, so welcome everybody. My name is Ed Noyons. I'm one of the researchers at CWTS. We are here, the three of us, uh, Ismail Raffles, Alfredo Yegros, and myself. And uh, Thomas Franson has also uh, contributed to this uh, work. Um, so we have been a, a partner in within Rhesus uh, since uh, the beginning. I will explain a little bit more about that uh, when I'm uh, when it's my turn. Um, but first of all, I would like to give you a short introduction into what we're going to say. So we're going to have a, a framing of the whole, let's say, the, the 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 context in which this takes place, and that will be done by uh, Ismail in a minute. And then we will have, um, uh, that's, that's basically the first part of our presentation today. And then there's uh, uh, two parts that are uh, being discussed. Um, uh, a part on priority setting, which will be done by Alfredo Yegros, where uh, disease burden of cancer is, uh, is compared or, or put in relation to the R&D output on that uh, topic. And then I'll, I will be the third one to discuss uh, the publication data set because this is basically a kind of um, uh, demonstration of how bibliometrics or data, a database like, uh, like we have at CWTS to be useful within the context of uh, policy making and uh, within the context of, uh, of RESIS, of course. Um, so I will describe in, in some words what the publication data set uh, entails uh, and what the added value of that is and what the advanced parts of it uh, entails. And then I will discuss uh, another application uh, which uh, relates to the connectedness of R&D to society in general. And then we'll have the discussion and the wrap up. So uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to uh, Ismail. Okay. Go ahead. Let me see. Okay, here we are. So uh, for about 10 minutes, I will make a brief introduction of why um, we are proposing this shift in the use of bibliometrics from the more traditional use of looking at academic contribution to a use of looking at what are the societal or mission oriented uh, contributions of, of research. Um, I will start by building on a way of looking at science policy developed by Johann Schott and Ede Steinmuller in a Spru. And they propose that there have been three main innovation frames. In the linear model that goes from the post-war until the 80s, Implicitly, there was the assumption that science would lead to technology, technology would lead to innovation, innovation would lead to economic growth and well-being. And a little bit like a sausage machine, like where you, you, you just crunch on the, the you put the, um, <clears throat> the, the meat on one side and like you put the science and you will have innovation. And uh, this has, this way of thinking about innovation um, led to certain types of indicators, or certain types of scientometrics. Um, there were inputs and outputs, and then publications was an output of science that was supposed to lead to technology and to innovation. Um, a second model was developed uh, in the 80s and became dominant in the 90s, which is the innovation system, which had <coughs> actually it is not enough having good science, it is not enough having good technology. You need, you need to have interactions between the organizations developing the science, the organizations developing the technology, and the uh, organizations putting the innovations in the market. And therefore, it's important to look at the interactions. And the, the model, which in a way is uh, captured by the um, Oslo manual focuses in, in the interactions. So uh, it is uh, all very good having good science, but it is important that this science is related to technologies. And, and this, for example, might be looked through uh, patent uh, publication relationships. Um, now, 
in the last 15, 10, 20 years, there was been a challenging of the implication in the innovation system model, which was that, okay, with the innovations you produce innovation, innovation produces economic growth, and economic growth leads to well-being. And the questioning says, well, it's not enough to have having innovation. We need having innovation in directions that are meaningful, that are conducive to societal well-being, to, to, to well-being in a variety of societal fields, for example, in terms of environment, in terms of health, um, even in terms of social relationships. So the, the fourth, oh, sorry, the third framing of, of innovation is this inclusive or transformative innovation where the direction of innovation matters. Now, um, in terms of uh, actual examples, uh, mission orientation in within the European Commission is an example of this shift from focusing on research being um, celebrated per se as the amount of science contributed and the quality of science contributed to asking research to be related to societal goals. Like the, in the European Commission, there is now these five goals, cancer, adaptation to climate change, healthy oceans, climate neutral, smart cities, uh, soil, health and food, in which the directions of the innovation, the directions which include also the directions of research matter, and in which the co-creation between diverse stakeholders is also important. And the question is, in this framework, what can bibliometrics contribute? And we propose that there are two issues in which it can contribute. The first one is uh, in, so bibliometric can provide maps in which we see the de facto priorities, the research directions, which matter in terms of what type of innovation uh, will be taken up. And also, um, bibliometrics, with all the limitations, can also capture some of the societal connections. But this is not uh, conventional bibliometrics. So where, where we are used to bibliometrics uh, producing tables with the ranks, like I said, the old model in, in this screen, uh, where you see the top organizations producing more, having the highest impact, we move to a way of looking into bibliometrics and we have maps in which different directions are possible and depending on the mission, you might want to be more interested in focusing on, in this case, uh, in the case of this map would be RISE research for consumption or maybe research that uh, does plant, plant protection, pre prevents pests in a way which is environmental. Um, and this is about mapping research portfolios. There can be two types of, of portfolios. On the one hand, we can have uh, the portfolios of which type of problems are being addressed um, in a given area. So this is in, in health. And this would be an example that uh, later on Alfredo will develop uh, in detail, which is comparing the health uh, needs, in this case, as estimated from WHO data on disease burden in blue against the research efforts. And we can see that uh, issues such as cancer, malignant neoplasms get relatively more research efforts in relation to their relative disease burden. And this is all in uh, relative terms at the global world, uh, level, whereas uh, infectious diseases uh, has relatively little research output in publications in relation to 
the disease burden at the global level. Now, what you can make from these comparisons is uh, questioning whether the current research priorities are appropriate to the most pressing uh, problems. And I should emphasize that data that is used to compare, such as disease burden, is uh, the estimates of disease burden are data that it comes with lots of limitations. So these uh, type of comparisons are only to put questions. They should not be used to uh, come up with conclusions without experts uh, discussing in depth how to interpret this data. So that's the first type of priority setting. What type of problems should be addressed? And the second type is, okay, within a problem, in this case, uh, this is a map on obesity research, one may ask oneself, okay, so given that we have the problem of obesity, how do we go about in addressing it? And there are a variety of potential strategies. You can focus more on understanding the metabolism in order to find pharmaceutical interventions so that people can take pills and reduce uh, their obesity. You can improve uh, the, att the, the attention to the diseases that are caused by obesity, like hypertension, cardiovascular, or understand the, this interaction between obesity and disease. You can go into clinical treatments to obesity, lifestyle interventions, so preventing so reducing the risk of uh, obesity, or you can go to study the social environments. Now, depending on the portfolio of research, it is more or less likely uh, that uh, then the solutions will come about in one or other area. Like so, uh, typically social environment is, is, is upstream and uh, produce uh, preventions at the high level, like what are the social determinants of obesity, of poverty, poor nutrition, whereas uh, treatments uh, is more further down the stream and might have less equal solutions. And this is up for debate as well, what are the directions that should be taken? Um, now, once the, the, the second issue that we think uh, Centometrics can contribute is in tracing some of the interactions between research and society. Now, um, in here we, we have to be modest because um, there are limitations to what centometrics can do, but, but at the same time, the, the, the databases are richer than they are usually being used for. From and here we use uh, the models or research, the methodologies on research impact assessment put forward in the also 10 last uh, 15 last 15 years, uh, in particular since the productive interaction model by Jack Spappen and Leonie van Droge, in which they say that in order for science to have societal contributions, <clears throat> you need to have some sort of interactions. But these interactions are extremely diverse. So um, you cannot just have one type of indicators of societal contribution. You may have, you need to have many different type of indicators, which will be useful in certain contexts and certain situations, and other indicators will be useful in other contexts and other situations. And the idea is to use the traces within centimetrics enlarge with uh, our metric database and this is uh, something that Ed will develop later on in order to trace the societal interactions. Now another important point is, is that most researchers do not interact directly necessarily with societal actors but they contribute to research communities in which some of the researchers do contribute. So rather than taking the societal contribution of one piece of research, we take as unit of analysis of the societal contribution, the research community, and then we'll be looking if researchers or if 
a given organization is working in the areas in which traces of societal contribution are found. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for the attention. So now it's uh, Alfredo's turn. Uh, yeah, I... You should... Um... It's, uh, I'm not a presenter, so I cannot share my, my slides, no? Mr. Raffles, can you... Okay, can you not know? There is a question. I... Yeah, there's a question which uh, is, is something that we will address in the last part of the... the last part of the session, yeah. okay. We can go on with uh, Mr. Yegros Yegros, please. Uh, yeah, but I want to share my slides, but I cannot do it uh, oh, now. Yeah. Moments, you... Yeah, so I think you can see it now, my... Okay. Yeah, can you see this slide? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, so, well, we, uh, good afternoon. I'm going to continue then uh, with the presentation. Uh, and this part, in the, few, in the next few minutes, I want to speak a bit about the possibilities of using bibliometrics in this context of priority setting. And I will focus on, on, on cancer again. Uh, this is, as, as you know, one of the uh, mission areas uh, that will be uh, included in the Horizon Europe uh, program of the European uh, uh, Commission. And, uh, well, this is, of course, a very broad area, right? Cancer. And what I want to do uh, in the next uh, minute is to um, kind of illustrate how we think bibliometrics uh, can be useful in order to support the priority setting uh, process in this context. So within cancer, which type of, of, of uh, problems could be could be addressed? What can bibliometric bibliometrics can can tell us about 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 this? Um, uh, so yeah, this is what what I will do. Uh, so uh, I'm going to to. To, to collect uh, 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 some publications from PubMed and from the in-house version of uh, CWTS, the in-house ver version of the Web of Science, uh, on cancer-related uh, publications. Uh, of course, well, cancer is not just one disease. There are many different types of, of cancers. So for these presentations, uh, we have selected 26 uh, different uh, types of, of cancer. So this that you can see in the, in the screen. Uh, we also focus on, on a number of countries. In this case, we have uh, uh, taken the EU27 plus uh, uh, the UK. Of course, you can do this kind of analysis looking at, at uh, the level of regions and, and such, but uh, uh, now we, we are going to focus on, this, on these countries. Uh, so the way in which we have been collecting the publications related to, to cancer is uh, we have been using PubMed. Uh, probably many of you uh, know this database and, and you know that uh, publications, they carry uh, different uh, mesh descriptors. So what we have done for these 26 different type of cancers is to select the descriptors that uh, uh, best uh, align with, with, with the specific cancer. So for instance, uh, uh, for trachea, bronchus and lung cancers, we have combined publications that, that have uh, these three uh, mesh descriptors. And then we use the web of science in order to collect uh, author affiliation as uh, the, the country where, where the authors work. And we, we have limited the, the data set to the years 2013, 2017. So in terms of, of bibliometrics, if you're familiar with bibliometrics, this will be, uh, of course, very familiar uh, to you. This is the kind of more traditional bibliometrics. So kind of things we can do is for instance, to look at, at how many publications on, on cancer each of the countries have produced. So when, when I speak about cancer, it's, it's the combination of these 26. And uh, of course, in this first uh, slide, uh, what we see is, 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 is related to the size of the country, to the, to the strength of the, of the uh, scientific uh, system in the country. We could do also look at the within the uh, biomedical uh, realm uh, field, we can see each of the countries uh, which percentage of publications relate to cancer. So we can see 
the orientation, so to say, of the of the different countries, how much they 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 focus on cancer. So we can see that Italy, Greece, France, for instance, they uh, they devote around 16, uh, 14 percent of publications in biomedical uh, fields to cancer. And we see other countries that that uh, uh, publish much less on on these topics. Something else we can do is to to look at the specific type of cancers the various countries are publishing on, are, are doing research on. And again, this is the type of more classical bibliometrics. We can also take, for instance, one of the uh, type of cancers. In this case, I took a breast cancer, and then we can see uh, the various countries, how much they are contributing to this uh, uh, specific cancer. And uh, we could also create kind of profile for the different countries. So in this case, for the Netherlands, we can see uh, the proportion of publications they are devoting to each specific type of cancer. Um, but again, this is more traditional uh, uh, bibliometrics. And if we have in mind this, this uh, priority setting idea, uh, it is clear that something important is, is missing, right? Because uh, no matter how um, close or far away we see this research uh, from application, something uh, important is that, is that this kind of research in the end uh, uh, should contribute to improve health conditions of those uh, suffering from cancer. So this is this is something missing in this part. Uh, so what what uh, we want to, to to do here is to somehow account for this for this social need, for these uh, uh, needs in society regarding cancer, and and to do that we use the uh, Department of Disease Statistics provided by the World Health Organization that somehow can tell us something about uh, about uh, people's need or, or about the how, how, how big is the problem associated to, to, to each type of the, of the cancer. So about disease burden, there are different, different type of indicators. Uh, one of them is, is the so-called uh, DALIS. And that's the one we are going to use. Uh, what is a DALI? A DALI uh, accounts for uh, two different things. Accounts for the uh, number of, uh, of, of years uh, lost of healthy uh, life due to either uh, an early death or uh, to the disability caused by, by a specific uh, uh, condition or, or disease. So we take this as an indicator of the social need. Um, and again, we, we, we take this information from the uh, World Health Organization. This is, this is public uh, statistics that anyone can, can, can use. So what, what we want to do is to combine bibliometrics with this uh, additional information. So we took these statistics corresponding to the year 2015. And in order to, uh, to map this burden of disease to the publications we have collected, uh, we uh, created a concordance uh, table uh, between the ICD-10 classification, which is the classification followed by the World Health Organization, when uh, providing these statistics and the mesh codes we have been using to collect the publications. So in this way, we can compare the number of publications uh, as a proxy measure of the research uh, being done uh, for the various cancers. And uh, uh, we can also compare it with the burden of disease associated to this, to this uh, type of cancers. So by doing, by doing this, we can create this kind of, of analysis. Uh, here, uh, you can see in the y-axis uh, the percentage of publications. This is, by the way, for the, for the uh, whole uh, EU27 and, and UK. Uh, you see the percentage of publications devoted to each specific cancer. And you can see in the x-axis uh, the proportion, the percentage of DALIs associated to those cancers. So here you can see, for instance, that uh, there are some type of cancers like uh, trachea, bronchus. Uh, they have a higher percentage of, 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 uh, of burden as compared to the, to the percentage of publications devoted to, to these cancers. And we have the opposite, for instance, in breast cancer, where 
we have a, a, a higher proportion of publications as compared to the uh, disease burden associated to this specific type of cancer. And this would be for, uh, as I said, for the entire uh, yeah, the li list of countries we have considered here. Then in this, in this chart, what, what we have done is to, to divide uh, these two values. So the percentage of publications by the percentage of, 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 of DALIs, by the disease burden for each of these cancers. And these pictures, uh, this picture uh, clearly show those cancers for which the, the burden of disease is higher as compared to the proportion of publications produced for these cancers. And this would be those that are in the left hand side uh, of, the, of the chart. So for these cancers, there is, there is more uh, burden uh, than, than, than research being done as captured by the, by the number of publications being produced. We have a number of cancers that are more or less um, uh, balanced with the number of publications and, and, the, and the disease burden. And if we go to the right, we see uh, those cancers that have uh, more publications as compared to the uh, disease burden they, they represent. Um, we can also do this for the various countries, of course. Here uh, we have the example of, of the Netherlands, it would be a, a country with, with a quite developed research uh, uh, system, and we can do it for, for all the other uh, countries, of course. Uh, we have here the example of, 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 of Malta, which brings uh, the, the possibility of thinking about uh, synergies, about uh, which type of research uh, uh, can be done in, in some countries and which type of research that is, is done elsewhere can benefit for, for, for can benefit to other countries, synergies between the various countries. Um, and this is a, a, a more or less the, the illustration I wanted to share. Uh, and uh, what we believe is that combining bibliometrics with this type of additional information increases the potential of, of these kind of tools to support the, the discussions on, on priority settings. As Ismael said before, this is a tool that we think can inform discussions, but there are too many limitations to take the, 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 the results we see as, as, as yeah, as, as taking decisions with them right away, but they can be very useful to inform discussions. So, of course, we are aware of the limitations of, of bibliometrics. For instance, in this context, an important limitation is that uh, we don't capture all the research that's been done by, by, by companies, for instance. Uh, clinical trials, not all of them will be captured by, by scientific publications. But still, it provides some uh, useful information. And also mentioned before by Ismael, the burden of disease statistics are, of course, also not free of limitations, but we think they can be informative in order to, uh, uh, to discuss this kind of, of information in, in these priority setting discussions. And this is more or less what I wanted to, to share uh, with you. So I think, um, yeah, I think uh, Ed can continue now. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Mr. Diego-Siedros. I would invite Mr. Noyans, I would invite you to go out from the share screen and invite Mr. Noyans to... The floor is yours, one please. Moment. One moment, we can... Okay. The assignment of your role of presenter and then we can go on the presentation of the study from Leiden University. Okay, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. Let's see if this works. Now you see a landscape, I hope. Some kind of landscape. Um, yeah. And hopefully you will see my first slide now. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. So okay. what I'm going to, um, to talk about first is about our uh, the CW publication data set. Um, it's important to discuss this because this is a major uh, part of the research uh, infrastructure. 
um, as we mentioned. Um, it's one of the, the big ones and the ones that were there from the beginning, but in different forms. So first of all, um, the CWTS publication data set was in, in the research platform first uh, initially as a, uh, as the, let's say the, the uh, information that is also in the LIDAR ranking. Uh, by coincidence, yesterday was the release of 2020. Um, so it's a, it's a list of universities uh, in the world with uh, general uh, bibliometric statistics on output, uh, impact and uh, collaboration. Um, but that's in that sense a bit of a limited uh, data set. So of course there was much more uh, interest from people uh, within research and, and, and researchers connected to research to look into the details of this uh, data. So in the end, we ended up with a, a CWTS uh, uh, version of the Web of Science that we had in-house to be part of, of the research infrastructure. Um, it's, I mean, the basic data can only be uh, accessed by a research visit at CWTS. I think there are even people in the room who have uh, done this. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, it's more about the, the, the value of the database. There are some license issues with the Web of Science and the ver version that we have, but that's not of uh, importance here. It's what I want to talk about more is what it is at, at this point and um, uh, in what way it can be used and how it has been uh, expanded. So um, uh, particularly to mention here is the main uh, enhancements within the, uh, within the context of research uh, that is important to know about. The author affiliation and the funding organizations are, uh, let's say, uh, um, harmonized and cleaned. Uh, that's a, uh, a permanent effort of uh, researchers at the CW, at CWTS. So we take care of the author affiliations within Web of Science and create our own, let's say, list of it. Some details about that later on. And another thing to mention here is the uh, publication level classification. Uh, which I will discuss in a minute. And, uh, and, and the last thing to mention here, which is uh, important for today, is the external information added to these publications. So uh, Ismail already mentioned this shortly. Uh, for instance, um, adding altmetric type of data to individual publication can create uh, information on the connections with society. Um, so the affiliations, <clears throat> as I said, is a continuous uh, effort of cleaning and harmonization uh, being done at our institute by the, what is called the, the A team, the address team at CWTS. Um, and that not only leads to better, let's say, name uh, um, uh, or clean names uh, of organizations, but also to uh, what, what we call a per, what is a permanent identifier. And that permanent identifier for organizations in general, not only universities um, and also for, for firms, makes it possible to connect easily with the other data sets within, uh, within research. So for instance, the patent, at the patent side, this is done uh, in a similar way, but then for patents and uh, with the European project uh, database, UPRO at uh, AIT in Vienna, they also do this work, but then for European projects, and other projects, uh, the information, and then we can create this link immediately through this permanent ID. Uh, so with that, we can create these links with other data sets. Um, just to I would just want to mention that it's not going to use today, but um, what is what is going to use today? What I'm going to talk about a little bit more is the publication level classification. It's, um, you can see it as a structure of all sciences, at least the, all sciences is represented by our, our data set, our CWTS publication database. Um, it puts individual publications into clusters, bags of publications. And um, so the, at, this at this moment, it's around 30 million publications from 2000 onwards. Each publication is put into a cluster on a similar topic. And this uh, positioning or this, this, this grouping of publication is independent from journal or journal classification. So now you can actually put a paper that is in Nature Science or PLOS One in other, uh, together with other publications that are about a similar topic, right? So this is the, um, 
let's say, a different way of uh, organizing publications than with using a journal or journal classification. In that sense, because it's based on, uh, and this, this clustering is based on papers citing each other, so one paper cites the other, and uh, this is the basis for this uh, clustering algorithm that puts them into uh, clusters and groups of publications. And um, so in that sense, you could see this as a more objective structure based on the input of uh, researchers or people writing the paper, the authors. So it's a kind of a self-organizing structure. Well, there are some challenge, uh, challenging elements in this kind of uh, 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 classifications, organizing papers, but I will not discuss this. So as you may have already seen or not, this is a typical representation of this uh, structure of all sciences, where you see uh, circles uh, representing these clusters, clusters so there are in this in this map there are 413 bags of publications so clusters of publications and they are organized um, uh, or they are positioned uh, uh, in, in um, uh, on the basis of their relation among each other um, and the, in this case the circle size indicates the number of publications that is involved but the position the distance between these uh, circles is uh, representing their cognitive relation, also the citation traffic that takes place within uh, among these uh, these individual circles, these, these clusters. And then there's a color coding to, to get some idea of what is the basic structure of this map. So this is when we are talking about the publication class, uh, publication level classification. We're talking about uh, information. Uh, uh, about, uh, sorry, uh, about the, 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 the clusters of these publications, clusters of publications uh, and, and the relation that they have with each other. Now, what you should know, what you should be aware of, that is uh, for each of these clusters, for each of these groups, group of publications, we know a lot of uh, things. So for instance, we know how many publications are in there for the full period, so the whole 20 years and per year. So we know something about the trend. We know about citation data, so the average citations per publication. So in that sense, we can use this, or actually we are using this uh, uh, information to uh, uh, to normalize citations for, for individual publications. So they are normalized by the cluster to which they belong and the year. Uh, we know other statistics like uh, the average number of, of authors within these circles. So they're, all these circles, they have different, let's say, characteristics, like the ones that you see here. But there's all kinds of other uh, characterizing indicators that we can uh, that we can uh, that we actually use. Uh, for instance, the proportion of open access publications, the proportion of papers with acknowledgments to a specific funder, uh, be it uh, the, uh, the European Commission or um, uh, well, you name it, Wellcome Trust. Uh, Proportion of international collabor collabor collaborative papers, um, which is also an indication for, let's say, internationality. Uh, the proportion of papers with industry or with a hospital, uh, etc., or the proportion of papers not in English. I will get back to these uh, some of these uh, in a minute. But these these indicators they all remain within the publication uh, and the citation database that we have. But we can also link uh, external data to these individual publications. For instance, the proportion of papers being mentioned on Twitter or being mentioned twice or three times on Twitter. Uh, the proportion of papers being mentioned in news items, the proportion of papers uh, mentioned in policy documents. All these things can be measured, can be calculated by individual cluster in our classification. So in each of these 4,000 something. Now, this um, uh, background information uh, leads to uh, leads me at least to the next uh, part of this uh, of this discussion, which is uh, the area based connectedness, the ABC, uh, which means the uh, or which is about uh, communities relating to society. Uh, coming back to what uh, Ismail said in the beginning, so the communities are basically or not basically, we consider the communities as an important, let's say, entrance into uh, uh, 
uh, measuring or, or monitoring the connectedness or the relation between R&D on one side, the R&D output on one side, and society on the other. Um, and the communities, we consider them, uh, in this case, uh, the communities are the clusters about a topic. So they are communities of papers. Uh, because they belong together, they are on a certain topic. Um, so in this uh, uh, area-based connectedness uh, approach, we um, define or we determine the relevance of R&D, the, the relevance of uh, R&D output to society and vice versa. Um, so such relevance should be measured at the community level, so at the cluster level, rather than at the actor level. You can imagine that within a cluster, there's a one actor uh, uh, working in a, in, a, in a specific topic. So let's say a university or an institute. Um, and the connectedness of that actor is not of importance. I mean, is of, of importance, but in our approach, the connectedness of the whole cluster is of importance. And I will get back, back to that in a minute. Um, so we can characterize, I already mentioned that uh, before, we can characterize these communities related to, uh, to their connectedness. And what that connectedness is, we will talk about uh, in a second, in a second. Um, uh, okay, this I will skip for the moment. Uh, but the point is, if we, uh, when you understand what this connectedness is about, you will understand that the higher or the stronger the connectedness, the higher the relevance for society. Uh, this, yeah, the, it's not the societal impact, it's the societal relevance for a certain community to society. Um, yeah, the key assumptions. So societal impact and, and actually uh, what we are going to talk about is relevance, uh, is too diverse and complicated to assess in a traditional and quantitative way. So we cannot, and, and there's many studies or many people already saying this, so the societal impact is not to be measured uh, in, the, in the traditional way as you can, for instance, uh, measure scientific impact if you consider that impact by citations. This is not possible with, uh, um, uh, with traditional bibliometric uh, um, uh, approaches. So we, we consider societal connectedness as a more productive approach because it says something about the potential of research being connected to society and society to be connected to research. So there's an opportunity there. Um, so connectedness like uh, a societal impact is not a merit of one actor only, it's a credit of a community. Uh, if you look at this, um, uh, uh, pile of uh, sandbags, this wall of sandbags, you cannot say in this, so this is, this is something, this, is, this wall basically keeps the water away from the land or where you live, right? This is uh, what this picture indicates. But you cannot say from this picture which sandbag is more important, right? They're all as important. They, together, they create this wall, uh, to, to keep the, the, the water uh, from, the, uh, from entering the land. So each individual sandbag has its contribution, of course. And in the end, this may lead to uh, some uh, uh, water, uh, some system to, um, to keep a whole country dry or a whole uh, region dry. Um, but then still you cannot say which bag was more important than, uh, than another. Uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort that has led to, in this case, an innovation of a, um, uh, the system that is, I think this is uh, something in the south of the Netherlands. Um, okay, so it's about uh, the community that is important for uh, societal uh, connectedness and societal uh, relevance. Uh, but what is that connectedness? How can we measure that connectedness? That is something we think we can, but we need to be very precise in what we're actually measuring here. So how to measure uh, connectedness of research? Um, we can do that through traces in output, signals and signals between research output and society. That's uh, what I'm going to uh, describe. 
And each trace, each signal represents a certain link, a connection, an interaction, a dimension of uh, connectedness. So if we um, go back to the information what we have on publications, we could say that papers co-authored by industry indicate some relevance of industry to R&D and vice versa. If we look at uh, co-authored papers with non-academic hospitals, it could show something about, could represent something of the relevance of local hospitals to R&D and vice versa. Another thing is the uh, uh, papers being published in local languages, so not in English, which, which indicates a uh, relevance for R&D for a local audience, um, etc. So papers being cited by patents, uh, papers being mentioned on Twitter, uh, papers being mentioned in policy documents, papers mentioned in news, they all have their kind of connectedness, but they are all different. That's what I will show you, that they are actually actually different. They, they represent a different, different dimension. So connectedness to society of R&D, of research output, uh, uh, um, um, comes in different dimensions, represents some different things. And we can also look at what we will do actually, one of the questions that was put forward uh, before is uh, the European funding. Um, so here we, we also um, indicated, we can indicate for each cluster the, the percentage of papers or the proportion of papers being funded by the European Commission. That says something about the relevance of the European Commission to a certain R&D or maybe the other way around. Okay, and now we will talk very shortly about the distribution of these traces and signals across all sciences. Now, if we take this map that you saw before, but then it was color coded by the, let's say the main fields or the main uh, disciplines. Uh, here, the color coding is based on the connectedness of policy. So the, the darker a circle, the uh, higher the percentage, the proportion, the relative percentage of proportion of papers being cited, being mentioned in policy documents. Now, if you have, if you remember the way that this map was more or less organized, um, um, we saw social sciences uh, uh, that is on the, the left-hand side, the upper left-hand side. We can take the conclusion where the darker circles are, are primarily in the social sciences, the cognitive psychology, uh, clinical studies, which is uh, the lower left side, and uh, life and earth, which life and earth uh, sciences, which primarily in the middle of the map and less so in the uh, natural sciences and engineering and mathematical and computer science. So this dimension is really focused in certain regions of the map. But you could, should also see that not all social sciences, uh, for instance, on the, on the, on the left uh, top of the map, not all these circles in that area are connected so strongly. So there are differences. There's a, diff there's a clear distribution, but there's also differences. Now, if we look at industry, so the, uh, the proportion of papers being done in collaboration with uh, or done by industry or co-authored by industry, authored or co-authored by industry, we see also a certain distribution, but it's completely different from what we saw before. Now, the, um, uh, the connection is primarily in the biomedical and pharmacy area, the lower part of the map, and uh, natural sciences and engineering, the right uh, upper left, uh, sorry, upper right uh, part and computer science. Um, yeah. So each, um, each uh, dimension of connectedness, this kind of overview, shows a different distribution. So it's very important when we talk about uh, societal relevance, we should, and we, and we talk about and, and, and we, we try to find out what is the what is the let's say the potential of uh, of research uh, to connect to to be connected to society. Uh, we should really be very sure, very clear about what dimension we're talking about because all these connectedness uh, dimensions they appear in different uh, uh, regions of the map. Um, okay. So um, this is what I want to show you about the ABC, uh, sorry, the, the connectedness. 
Um, but it's a, that's inter interesting. So how can we use this? How can we? What what kind of opportunities uh, does this this way of looking at things and and this data, of course, that we have, uh, which opportunities do they uh, create? And we take the example of the European uh, Commission funding through the cancer lens. So um, we collect, we, we use the same uh, selection of papers being uh, what Alfredo discussed uh, on, on cancer by, uh, by PubMed uh, selection. And um, we collected them by country and uh, we distributed uh, these papers uh, across the communities, the areas in the map. So you will probably see then on the lower left side, most of them are, are, are uh, let's say, uh, uh, positioned on the in the clusters on the left hand side in the at the bottom in the biomedical area and for these communities we have the information of european funding we have the information on industry involvement we have the information on local hospital involvement and local interest which is the non-english the proportion of non-english uh, papers and these two things we are going to uh, combine um, and the results is, uh, uh, so at, uh, I took the uh, entity of a country as, 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 a, as an entrance point into the analysis. So a country's cancer research output, so the number of publications that uh, 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 a country has on, uh, on cancer in the, uh, through the uh, collection of uh, Alfredo, so to say. We characterized uh, by uh, or via the areas in which uh, a country is active, EU funding, the industry involvement, local hospital involvement and local interest. So each paper is characterized by the area to which it belongs. So each, each paper that a country has on cancer gets the characterization through the area to which it belongs. Um, and then you can create uh, country-wise correlations between these characterizations. So, I take uh, EU funding as a kind of central or, or uh, yeah, basis, uh, basis for uh, distribution. Uh, so here you see on the x-axis uh, for uh, uh, the European countries, um, the, the, the connectedness through EU funding. So in which areas they publish uh, their cancer research and with the, uh, combined with the information on the EU funding for those clusters in which they publish. And this I correlates to the, um, uh, the ABC of industry. So the same uh, clusters in which they publish, of course, but now I, I take on the uh, Y axis, the uh, industry involvement, or so the, the interest from in, uh, 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 industry. So what we see here, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it, it, we don't have time to, to explain this in, in in detail but you see a certain correlation here right when the eu funding goes up the abc the um, the industry involvement also goes up so that means if you can say that the cancer areas with relatively large ec funding also have a dense industry involvement uh, and vice versa so the uh, the research that has a large um, or a dense industry involvement uh, is in areas where there's a relatively high EC funding. And if we look at uh, the local interest as compared to the EU funding, we see basically the opposite. So when um, um, cancer areas with large, relatively large EC funding address less the local audience and vice versa, right? I mean, we can imagine that this is the case, but this is something that you can actually find out by approaching it in this way. Uh, thirdly, uh, which is, seems to be similar to uh, what we see for uh, local interest, so the, uh, the involvement of local hospitals also correlates in a negative sense with the EU funding. So the areas, the cancer areas in which there is more uh, um, 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 local hospitals involved, so yeah, I don't know, there, there's probably a word for that, that the type of research that, that, that is covered by that. Uh, in general, or let's say on, on um, uh, appropri uh, appropriately, has less um, uh, EU funding. That type of research. Um, yeah. 
So what, what kind of insights do these uh, um, uh, analysis uh, give us? So these community area characterization provide new insight and a world of opportunities, as you can imagine, because I just showed a few of them. Um, uh, so adding information to publication output provides such uh, characterization. These are just general um, uh, conclusions that we can draw already. Um, uh, I also want to mention here that this also provides potential links to societal challenges, missions and SDGs. So what we did already with the cancer research, but that could also be done for the SDGs when you connect, uh, when you in some way can connect um, um, uh, sustainable development goals to uh, clusters in which uh, papers are addressing these issues, then you can create connectedness in terms of, um, uh, sorry, you can create connectedness from different dimensions uh, from research to uh, to the SDGs. Now, if we look at the results, um, uh, they seem to, pin, to point to uh, easy funding in cancer research involves industry, less hospitals. And then you may ask, how does this relate to the uh, to the notion of uh, co-creations? So does this, uh, is this in line or is this something that we want, that the European uh, uh, Commission wants? And the other thing is if EC funding in cancer research involve less the local audience, how does this relate to uh, smart specialization? Um, we we, we of, uh, obviously we see something that is not in, uh, that, that does not support uh, smart um, uh, specialization regional uh, development. And I think this is uh, my last slide. Yeah, on this last slide, there is uh, a couple of uh, literature. There's there's some literature mentioned. Um, when you, uh, I think these these um, slides will be shared with the community, or can be shared at least, or you can make a picture of it um, to um, uh, to look up this uh, this information, background information for uh, most of the things that have been said. There is some more, but these are the the highlights of it. And with that, I want to close this part of the of the meeting yes okay thank you very much uh, mr noyans i remind you to the materials or so the slides and the references uh, will be shared to our mailing list to our participants so every information will be uh, available for the participants and then there was a, a question from carlos benito amat uh, who asks, uh, can funding be considered interaction? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's an interaction. Uh, I mean, the, the precise uh, interaction uh, probably depends uh, uh, depends on uh, on uh, what kind of funding we are talking about. Uh, but as I uh, as I have shown, this um, uh, European funding. Uh, um, um, connect or sorry, kind of connecting this, uh, uh, um, or sorry, the distribution over the map already shows where the EU funding uh, goes at this point. I mean, I didn't show that map. Well, I think I showed that map. One of these maps contained that. It's primarily in the lower part of the uh, of the map, and that indicates that there is some connectedness of um, uh, what, at least, what the EU wants to fund and uh, the research that's being done. Uh, so I, I see it as a connect, uh, connection, definitely, uh, but it, uh, it it really depends, I think, on the uh, on the um, let's say the, the the program or the uh, body that you're looking at. Okay, okay, fine. There there are uh, other two questions. One from uh, Mr. Wade uh, Wade the books. Uh, how papers and policy connection traced. What kind of method and database have been used for tracing the connection? Yeah. So in this case, um, yeah, in this case, we used a connection um, uh, what is uh, provided by uh, altmetric uh, data, um, and we um, um, we I mean this is this is a proper first uh, approach for this. Uh, so you see it kind of. Uh, so what Altmetrics uh, data does is uh, a DOI 
is, is looked up in policy documents and when it's mentioned there, then uh, this DOI gets, let's say, a, a connection. Uh, that, that, that's what Altmetric data does, Altmetric data does. Uh, nowadays, there are more and better um, uh, facilitated um, uh, uh, databases like uh, Overton, um, there's many, many more uh, policy documents and we're currently exploring this, uh, this option as, a, as an add information to publications. It does the same, eh? so it connects individual research papers or DOIs in general to policy documents. So there's a, there's a huge, uh, I think around 3 million publications or policy documents at the moment that are connected to, uh, to uh, research outputs like uh, publications. Um, and that creates uh, even more opportunities that we than we see here. But it's uh, primarily it's it's altmetric data for, for for what we have used here. Okay, that's fine. And, uh, there are other two questions. I remind to the participants they uh, if they wish they can also uh, address uh, the question. Uh, I we can unmute the microphone and. Uh, switching off uh, switching on the camera the other question is uh, from uh, uh, mr Osgur kadir ozer um, uh, should and could we include temporal dimension to the analysis yeah i think we should uh, and, we, and we and we we can but for um alpetric type of data it's not yet possible because it's not robust enough enough um, so we calculate this primarily for the last four years because in that period there is sufficient uh, and, 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 and substantial uh, information. But before that it was simply not there. Uh, so we are building up and uh, so in the end there will be, uh, that, that's definitely possible to have a, a more temporal um, uh, or at least to put the time dimension in it. Yeah. Okay. Then another one, Mr. Eris Papig, uh, excuse me for the um, uh, pronunciation, uh, Papagaju, uh, are these clusters publication based solely on citation metadata? Can you elaborate more on how the clusters are labeled and created? So, yeah, very shortly, because this is a, this is a complicated uh, matter. So it's uh, these clusters are based on direct citation. So uh, these 30 million publications citing each other. That's the only one citing the other. That is the information that goes into what is nowadays called the Leiden algorithm to do this clustering. Um, um, and um, yeah, so it's, ba it's, it's only based on that. Uh, it gives good results. Um, um, how they are labeled, um, that's, that depends on the level. So there are different levels. So the most, uh, uh, let's say, fine-grained level that we use at this moment is the 4,000. Uh, but we could, could even go beyond that, but let's say that's the more, most fine-grained or the highest resolution. And um, uh, indeed, these clusters, of course, they have no label. They, they are just bags of publications, as I said. So they need to be labeled. And for that, there's an algorithm uh, used uh, to get at least some idea of what is inside. Looking at uh, terms from particular titles in those publications that are uh, relevant for a cluster and not so relevant for another cluster. So uh, you compare, in fact, the, let's say, the in a simple way uh, said uh, the top uh, terms in one cluster you compare it to all the top terms in other clusters and see to what extent they are specific for that cluster so that's how we label them and um, curated i guess that you mean the updating of uh, of data uh, at, at present we uh, perform this task every year in the after week 13 of the new year we create a new classification. And then we make a comparison with uh, the structure that we had the year before. And we notice that, I mean, it's important to have to stay up to date in the sense that it's not just, we put new publication to the cluster that already exists because we want to know what is the dynamics of, of research, right? So we want to know what's happening, what the contribution of the last year has been. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
on the one hand, we want it to be dynamic. On the other, we also want to have some stable uh, part in it, uh, some stability in it. And, and for that, we um, uh, look at the, uh, so we compare the solution of a year before with the current uh, solution. And we look how bad is it or how, how, how much has science changed? And I'm not saying that science, uh, that, that, that science is uh, conservative, but we don't see many changes actually. So clusters become bigger and sometimes they're split. And sometimes things are merged, but it's really minor in, in, in a sense. Uh, so it's in that sense quite stable. But the, the labeling of clusters is an issue uh, because we can give these, these specific terms, these, 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 let's say, discerning or discriminative terms, and it gives an idea uh, of what the content is. And we can show something about the journals that are important in a cluster. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's an algorithmically and, and an ad hoc uh, situation or, or a solution. Uh, but we never know exactly. But do we know, is there any final or, or easy to understand structure of all science? It doesn't exist, right? Not all, also not with the journal classification. It's, there's a lot of discussion about that. But anyway, yeah. Thank you very much for this explanation from Mr. Noyons.